Okay. Hi, everyone. So my name is Yair Geva, head of the tech practice at the Herzog Fox Neyman. We have here Michael Eisenberg, uh, a person who needs no introduction, a venture capitalist with Aleph and chairman of the Shomer HaChadash, uh, and our own Daniel Reisner, head of the defense practice at Herzog uh, and reserve, colonel, uh, reserve duty colonel at the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. In this webinar, we'll discuss the very hot topic uh, of funding and structuring defense tech companies in Israel and globally. Uh, and we're going to touch upon a few questions relating to how we structure those companies, uh, what is the current climate for uh, funding them, uh, go to market uh, strategies, etc. Uh, I would like to nonetheless start with a question to both of you, Daniel and, and Michael, uh, about the new uh, Secretary of State policy regarding visa restrictions to the US as it relates to um, uh, cy offensive cyber and potentially Israeli companies and their employees that could be affected by, by that decree uh, or new policy. What are your thoughts? So, Where is this coming from? What's, the, what's, the, what's behind this? So, um, first of all, hello everyone. It's a pleasure being here and thanks to Michael and Yair for making this happen. Um, this didn't come out of nowhere, but it did come up uh, as a surprise. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, the U.S. administration, this U.S. administration, has been on the offensive against the Israeli offensive cyber uh, uh, sector for several years now. The highlight until now has been uh, when they added two leading Israeli companies, NSO Group and uh, another company called Kandiru, to the U.S. entity list, which is a, an export control sanctions list. Um, so, and in addition, I I know that there have already been cases in the past where visas related to people in the offensive cy uh, cyber security business have been revoked because of that relationship. So I think what we're seeing is another escalation in the U.S. administration's fight against the Israeli offensive cyber industry. Um, I think the more interesting question is why are they doing this? And uh, my feeling is that there is someone in the, uh, actually it's not a feeling, I know, there's someone in the administration who has taken this to be their baby and is pushing for it. And in addition, I think we cannot uh, totally uh, 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 disengage this from the fact that uh, uh, only two, uh, day before, the president issued an executive order sanctioning some Israeli right-wing Israelis. So if we look at it from a big picture perspective, this is another signal from the US government to Israel that they are unhappy with some of the things the Israeli government is doing. But if we look at it in the defense industry, it's just a continuation of, of a negative policy towards this industry in Israel which this administration has had from day one. Michael? I broadly agree with uh, Daniel uh, on this uh, and agree with just about everything he said. I would add two things. I, I think there's, there's two problems here, one on the American side, one on the Israeli side. This should have been predictable because it's as Daniel said it's happened before this is not the first time and there's somebody working tirelessly inside one of the organs of the executive branch of the US government to make sure this happens and the Israeli uh, government should have been prepared for this and must have a policy uh, for what to do about offensive cyber because we need offensive cyber in Israel could you imagine if we went into this war having to go rescue kidnap citizens without offensive cyber tools we would be handicapped uh, and we need to have an offensive cyber uh, industry. And so whether it's nationalization, the creation of something like a Rafael uh, for offensive cyber or something like that, uh, we need to have a policy answer in Israel to this. The second thing I think though, is this is a bit outrageous by this uh, fanatic inside the U S government that this should become U S government policy uh, to uh, chill 
the ability of very talented individuals to go into this industry by threatening to pull or not allow their 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 visas. And you know, Israel is not a vassal state of the United States. It is a dependable partner of the United States. And I'm I'm a dual citizen of both countries. And you know, in partnerships, there is one larger partner here, you know, significantly larger partner, which is the United States. But I don't think partners do this to partners. And I think it's important to stand up and say that um, this is not okay that the U.S. decided to do this. And, but, but it needs an answer, policy answer from the Israeli government as well. And they, they, they cannot fall asleep on this. And unfortunately, I think they have fallen asleep on this up until this point. So Daniel may have some difference of opinion on that or might not, but. No, no but uh, Michael, when NSO and Kandiru were added to the entity list, we got zero advance notice and we were caught entirely by surprise. And when I say we, I mean the state of Israel. I don't mean me personally. I, I was shocked, but the fact that the state of Israel was shocked is an indication of the level of lack of cooperation between the governments with respect to this issue. So is there something I've learned, uh, uh, and I've been doing this now for quite a while, you know, I've been playing in this area now for 39 years. Um, the current administration and the Israeli government do not cooperate and do not collaborate. They are helping us immensely in the current war, but they don't like us. And they're doing it in spite of our government, not because of it. And therefore, what we're seeing is incredible, unprecedented assistance from the U.S. people to Israel in this time of need, but an administration which really wants to hurt this current Israeli government and would like that to be known and felt and they have agenda items, etc. And this is a very complicated relationship right now. And I don't think we could have seen this coming. I have to tell you, Michael, I was surprised again. I didn't think they would do this during the war. I thought, not only for the reason you mentioned that uh, offensive cyber capabilities are, of course, really important during such a conflict, but because it's not something you, you don't stab an ally in the back when they're at war. You just don't do that. And yet they, they appear to be happy to be doing the two things that in parallel at the same time, which just goes to show you, A, how much we understand about U.S. politics and B, uh, uh, how complicated the relationship is. And, and I guess this this issue highlights uh, generally our dependence on the U.S. as it relates to defense tech as a whole, right? So and this is a topic we'll be uh, discussing today. Um, so moving to that, and, and the reason we are having this discussion is that, you know, many people are coming back from their reserve duty now. They have these amazing projects they worked on, uh, and they're thinking, look, we should do LBIT 2.0 uh, and, and put together those new companies that are innovative and new and software approach. Uh, to defense tech, etc., uh, and this raised a lot of questions that uh, that we wanted to run uh, here by you, Michael and uh, Daniel. Perhaps I'll start with you, Michael. Uh, is there a definition in your mind to defense tech? Do you think that's a, a, an ecosystem that will be growing? Are we expecting to see funding of companies in that field the way you you would define it? I realize we just had a war here. Um, but the world has been getting more complicated for the last bunch of years. And it's time to make venture capital investments, which take a long time to kind of develop in this in this area, uh, was three or four and five years ago, uh, particularly for the hardware companies, which take a long time. That's when Anduril, the big U.S. company, came, came into being. You have to kind of see this coming. Uh, we're now kind of, you know, three or four years into the instability, Russia, Ukraine, which really started it. Um, you know, companies like Andrew were ready for, for Russia, Ukraine. And so uh, I think we're a little late to the party, um, but not too late because, unfortunately, I think there'll be stability for a while. But I think that makes the emphasis on things that are not eight to 10 year projects, but, you know, two to three to four year projects. So more software, which anywhere Israel is good at, more drones and kind of agile uh, products, uh, more AI uh, and, and other things, maybe synthetic biology and biological weapons and biological defense, uh, where Israel has has an advantage uh, in particular, and the development cycles are perhaps uh, shorter. What we definitely need is a new prime, meaning we cannot, Rafael Elbit, 
I I toss you off, right? Are past their prime, no pun intended. <laughs> are past their prime. Uh, the UI uh, shocks the hell out of the soldiers right now. I mean, anyone who's looked at the the Sayad and compares it to an iPhone uh, needs to scratch their head. Uh, we need to update uh, these companies, and Israel needs a first class, twenty first century prime contractor. Uh, an agile development defense company. Uh, and so I think there's real opportunity there, but, but we're specifically, um, they'll depend on the entrepreneurs and how they come out and they need to find things that are scalable, not just to kind of solve the problem in the tunnel in Gaza. Michael, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned Anduril and uh, I heard this conversation with uh, Palmer Lucky, the, the founder, the person who founded Oculus. Uh, and he was saying that, um, a software-only approach would be very difficult and problematic in the space of defense, right? He's saying you have to have a hardware-software approach uh, if you don't want to be dependent on uh, on those uh, contractors. Uh, in the same way that Tesla and SpaceX control the whole uh, um, chain, uh, how does this work with uh, in in a VC ecosystem, definitely in Israel, where you think a bit shorter term, as you had mentioned? Um, and how, how could that affect funding? So in general, I agree with Palmer. And obviously, uh, there will be a lot of big systems that require hardware software integration for sure. The military is also going to go to more off-the-shelf things. We need swarms. Somebody, there's a drunk guy here in Uh There is, you know, there's going to be a lot of off-the-shelf things in order to combat the, the missile projects. In the north, we need to think about, you know, like uh, swarms that are cheap, that are perhaps civilian technology. I'm not going to surprise anyone uh, by saying that, that many things don't need to be top secret. You can use civilian technology with, with military-grade software. And so in many cases, you do need hardware software integration, but I think we're going to an era where there'll be more commodity hardware that's powered by other software or maybe with smaller hardware integrations. Yeah, here? Yeah, Daniel, you mentioned 39 years of experience in the field. So do, do you think we're progressing towards what the vision that Michael is presenting of uh, a 21 century defense contractor in Israel? So le let me say a few things about this. First thing is that uh, uh, Israeli defense contractors are not a viable business unless they can sell to the U.S. and a few other major countries. Israel itself is not a big enough market to justify any company, let alone a defense company. Uh, that is before we talk about the fact that the Israeli government is cheap and is unwilling to pay uh, top dollar. And uh, even from Israeli companies would prefer to use US FMS funding instead of Israeli shipping. So at the end of the day, if you want to set up a new defense business, your product must be attractive not only to the IDF fighting the war in Gaza or Lebanon, but it has to be attractive to SOCOM and to the German government and to the UK military and to the countries which can afford to pay enough money to keep a defense company running. Secondly, Israel isn't good at large platforms. We don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the space, we don't have the factories, we don't have the trained personnel. And so we're really good at high tech side of the defense industry. We're good at radars, we're good at chips, we're good at missiles, the things which are relatively small. We're, we're not as good at big platforms, although our tank is good. It's an exception to the rule, it's not the rule. So any tech entrepreneur uh, who comes out of the army or is sitting at home right now and has a great idea has to ask himself the following questions. A, will I be able to sell this not only to the Israeli government, but to a foreign government so I can pay my bills and make money? B, by the way, the answer to A is dependent primarily on the classification of the project. Because if your product is going to be classified, you will almost certainly not be able to sell it anywhere around the world, except maybe the US, and even that's going to be complicated. B, will I get a license to sell it abroad? Because if it's the ultimate solution to Hezbollah missiles, I'm going to tell you the Israeli government is not going to let you sell that to anyone so that we can keep the secret sauce for ourselves. But when we explain to them, and we do it all the time, that if you keep the secrets to ourselves, the companies can't afford to stay alive, they say we're not responsible for the business, we're responsible for the license. 
Three, if you want funding for a defense company, you need to realize that there are very few funding possibilities in Israel. There are very few funds, and uh, Michael understands this better than anyone, who are willing to put money into new defense companies, and if you're in the offensive cyber business, even less willing to put money into those. And so at the end of the day, both of the funding usually comes either from the US or from other parts of the world where you and I are playing all the time, but which make it much more complicated in the Gulf, make it much more complicated in the defense industry because no one in the Israeli government would really want someone from the Gulf controlling a defense company in Israel. So at the end of the day, you need to hit a very small target. You have to have a product where it makes sense to develop in Israel, which as Michael said, is scalable so that you can make money. It's not enough to sell 100 pieces of anything. You need to have a capability to have a product which people will buy in mass. And three, which you can technologically and regulatorily sell abroad. If you have something of that nature, you'll get the investors as well. And, and you may be on your way to setting up a Rafael 2.0 or LB 2.0. But it's a narrow window. It's not, it's not a, an easy shot. It actually sounds almost impossible, what you just described. Right? It sounds like the ecosystem as a whole is disencouraging innovation, in a way. Um, the buyers no, are no. usually... Go it, ahead. It doesn't disincentivize innovation. It disincentivize innovation creating new companies in the defense sector. So for example, if an Israeli startup comes up with a great solution, what usually happens is they get bought. And they got bought quickly by one of the bigger defense companies. To actually take a small startup in the defense world and transform it into a big company, that hasn't happened for many, many years. So does, does this mean that uh, st if I was uh, out of Miluim now starting my new company in the defense because I saw that we could put together software hardware and deliver a, a great solution to something that is need, does this mean that I should not be probably not hoping to get my funds from a VC, but rather from strategic investors, government? How would how would one should think about funding it, his, his new company in the field? Michael, you want to start? Look, I just funded a uh, and have over time a couple of defense companies, but they're in particularly uh, particular areas. One, one was publicized Dream, um, which is in you know AI for defending critical infrastructure. Um, the other one is not public yet, but they are in particularly uh, scalable and less regulated industries. To to Daniel's point, or le less regulated parts of the stack. Uh, and uh, they have, I would call it, less product complexity than your average Anduril, uh rocket or drone. Um, and so in general, I think using venture capital dollars to fund defense companies is a complicated matter. There are very few scalable businesses. Um, and that's why I think I wrote this in a, in a response to somebody on the text. The Israeli government actually needs to commit to be a first customer for many of these companies. And most of them will get bought, exactly like Daniel says, by the prime. There'll be innovation and these will be exits, but they won't be venture capital exits for the most part. And what we actually need is a government customer fund and customer approach to go do that. And I think Daniel's right about that. Yeah, and, and on that, the Ministry of Defense recently set up uh, uh, two new funds. No, they reached an agreement with two existing funds to do matching investments in defense tech, which is interesting to the Israeli government. And that's a step in the right direction, but there are two problems. One is the fact that it's a minuscule amount of money, meaning it doesn't make any difference. Two is, uh, uh, I and remember, I spent 20 years in the Israeli military. I spent over 30 years working for the Israeli government. I don't recommend to any of my clients that the first customer will be the Israeli government. I do not recommend that. The reason is that the terms and conditions and the things you have to give up in order to do that are so onerous that you start off with a handicap. Sometimes you have no choice. Sometimes they're the only clients available. Okay, so we make the best of what we have. But I can tell you from personal experience that companies that start off with a defense product with the Ministry of Defense, 
find it very difficult to break free from the Ministry of Defense when they want to go international. Again, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. For me, I actually think that the best approach for an Israeli company starting up and having something which is unique and timely and technological, etc., is actually to try to partner with a U.S. company as soon as possible, not an Israeli company, a U.S. company. A, that, a if you get the approval for that, you need licenses for everything I said, you've just opened the planet. B, uh, uh, and there are some U.S. companies and some U.S. players, I'm not talking about just venture capital, I'm talking about companies as well, who are very happy to find synergetic uh, uh, technologies around the world, invest in them, and then go along for the ride, and maybe later acquire you. So if you can get, and, and I'll remind you, for example, the famous example of NSO, which uh, L3 Harris wanted to acquire. And that was shot down by the White House. Now, I was the lawyer for L3 Harris in that transaction. So I went through the entire process. And L3 Harris said, "We, you have great technology. We can sell it and make much more money than you guys can. Uh, uh, so there was a great synergy there. The fact that the White House killed it is because it's in the offensive cyber world. But in other areas, that same synergy can be a really a false multiplier. Michael, you had mentioned uh, Dreams. Uh, who, uh, we had the pleasure also of being involved in that deal as as, as lawyers, uh, and and we know that the ceremony you held at, I believe, at Kibbutz Nirim, uh, uh, for closing that deal, and uh, this was a very important uh, transaction. It also highlighted the without getting into details, but it was uh, made public. There was a relationship with the Gulf state uh, involvement, etc. Do we foresee or expect, uh, I mean, Daniel and us see that all the time. Do you expect the UAE to be replacing, in a sense, the US as buyers for our technology? Is that something that is doable? It's the same size, same scope. Uh, it's a smaller market, I presume. Uh, uh, what's our thinking here, given all those restrictions and uh, issues with uh, selling into the DOD in the US? There are only two countries in the world with the same scope as the United States of America. One is China that I don't think any of us want to sell defense technology to, or I hope none of us do. And the other is India, which even though it has the scope, it doesn't yet exactly have the financial scope to go do it. It has the population scope, but not the financial scope. So I don't think there's anything called a replacement for the United States of America when you're selling defense tech. It just doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, the UAE, I hope, will be an important partner of Israel in general going forward. I, I wouldn't count on it to solve the customer side of the defense tech industry here. Doesn't mean it can't be a nice business at venture scale. Right. But that's not the market people should be targeting as uh, uh, the main go-to market. Uh, Daniel, can you expand on the... on the? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the business of giving out... I don't want to give out general advice as to what people should target their markets on a call like this. Unless you look at... Each individual company is not responsible to give out the job. Makes sense. Uh, Daniel, uh, if we can get a bit more technical, though, as we are raising here, you know, issues such as who you sell to and, and uh, the regulations around it, there are US regulations, there are Israel regulations. Uh, could you, I have one question that came to mind is, should one think about forming the parent company as a US company, given the desire that most people have probably is to sell to the US market? Does this make any difference should people form israeli companies um so let me start by saying that an israeli company can sell to the u.s government but it will be at a disadvantage against u.s competitors so yes you can set up a u.s subsidiary and sell through that and many israeli companies including the big ones have done that and they have been successful Although for the complicated and classified projects, the US company has to operate as a black box with no leakage of information to the Israeli owners. 
And that is possible, and it is done, and we've done it before, and we can support it. That, that's okay. an Israeli requirement? or, or no, that's a U.S. requirement, because on the sensitive projects in the U.S., only Americans can be involved, and the IP has to be in the U.S., and the and manufacturing has to be in the U.S., etc. Management now, should be American too, right? The, the, they should management be US. have to be American, uh, yeah. Uh, but for the classified projects or for the sensitive ones. The U.S. government can buy foreign source goods, but it's always a third choice. They first prefer made in America, then they prefer products which are uh, co co collaborated with American companies, and a foreign company would come in third in this respect. So if the U.S. government is your primary go-to, I would definitely recommend a structure in which you have a, a U.S. top code. That would also be easier for U.S. investors because obviously they would want to prefer to invest in a U.S. company. For sale to the Israeli government, interestingly enough, a U.S. top code is fine as well because Israel prefers to buy using U.S. dollars instead of Israeli shekels. So interestingly enough, we have Israeli companies who manufacture items in Israel, then transfer the know-how to the U.S. subsidiary, and that U.S. subsidiary sells to the Israeli government in an, in an FMS aid using U.S. dollars. So there are lots of workarounds, but I think everyone will be happy with the U.S. company selling to Israel as long as the U.S. foreign aid to Israel exists. However, if I remember correctly, that has an expiration date in the next few years. It sounds like uh, we have this term in Israel, Israblos, what you just described, but... Um... <laughs> it's done a bit more sophisticated than what I said, and there is actual manufacturing done in the US to meet certain conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Really? And the IP is transferred to the US company because otherwise it's ineligible for FMS. So without going to be too technical, it has to be a real US item. But Israeli companies have developed U.S. items to sell to the Israeli government. That's what I'm saying. Uh, 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 because there's cheap dollars and there's expensive It's, it's not a Yisra blow. It's the... Go ahead, Dan. I thought we're done. Sorry. No, no. Michael, can you repeat? It was interesting and I couldn't hear you. No, oh, oh, oh. All I said was it's not a Yisra bluff. Rather, it's the Universal Lawyer Employment Act. It keeps Daniel in business, <laughs> these things. <laughs> Thank God. Thank yeah. God for that law. Uh, yeah, Daniel, you had mentioned the, the, the sacred words IP. Uh, how, how does one think about IP? Well, you know, it's a complicated issue in defense, right? You get exposed to IP. The, is, should we think about the, uh, the military as uh, an academic institution where people were part of and developed the IP while working for that institution? The, the military has IP rights into the technology. How does that work? So first of all, I don't know the answer to that, Yair, and I don't think anyone knows the answer to that, and I'll explain. Uh, usually when you have an employee and that employee develops IP during the work for you, the an IP belongs to the employer, not to the employee, okay? I don't know what is going to happen now with all of these reservists who develop technology during the reserve duty, go home, and then suddenly they come up with a new product. I also don't think the Ministry of Defense has the manpower, energy, or sophistication to go after everyone. I can tell you that easier fruit to go after, which is military officers, serving in technological units, retiring and setting up a company selling exactly the same product they developed for the army, not reservists, but career officers, they don't go after them either. So my guess is that the Ministry of Defense won't have the bandwidth to go after this issue. That being said, investors may be hesitant if they understand that this is the project which was developed while the person was in the military, a sophisticated investor, the Michael types, will ask these questions, and then they say, wait a minute. So there's always a chance that in five years' time, the Ministry of Defense will knock on the door and say, wait a minute, you stole that from us. That is less valuable than it could have been. So I don't think 
the Ministry of Defense will actively go after that. I don't think they have the capability, but it's always going to be there the sort of a risk that you need to manage because you never know. Clear. There's an audience question is here, which is, uh, do people, should people think about forming two separate companies, one for defense and one for the civil use? That's the yeah. way to go? Yeah, so we, let me explain. It goes like this. If the technology was born in the defense world, you're stuck because the moment it's a defense technology, the fact that you also found a civilian use for it will, will never remove the fact that it's a, te a defense technology. So for example, if you develop a new missile and while developing that new missile, you suddenly have a better uh, infrared emitter, which you can also use for civilian uses, the regulators will always remind you, yes, but it came out of that missile and therefore will need licenses for from here to eternity. However, if you manage to develop generic civilian technology and then you want to take it and use it for the defense world, I strongly recommend setting up a, a and there are different structures that we can of course discuss, but a separate entity for the civilian and the defense world so that you focus all of the radioactive regulatory regimes on one company, the defense company, while leaving the other company devoid of all of this rubbish. Uh, but it's a bit more complicated than that because there are also uh, licensing and tax consequences to everything I just said. So it requires a bit more tweaking, but the short answer is if you're born civilian, yes, I think two companies is the way to go. If you're born defense, it's a waste of time. That's uh, that's extremely helpful uh, and uh, in a way wraps up the questions that uh, I've had prepared and, and from the audience that I received during the call. Uh, Daniel, Michael, any further thoughts, comments, ideas, suggestions to the audience as to how to uh, develop their own new startups in the field? Uh, other items to consider in that regard? I'll say any startup has to remember that at the end of the day, for me, it's always about product. In other words, and I've had this argument with a client recently where I said product before branding, and he said, no, it's branding before product. And I know there are different schools of thought on this, and uh, and Mike, and you mentioned Andoril, and Andoril was uh, branding before product from day one, but the great company. Uh, uh, um, so, I am a product before branding person, which means make sure you've got a product which has a, a an industry edge, uh, which is in time, and there is a need for it. And we have to remember that the global defense market has, I think, more than doubled in the last five years because of Ukraine, because of Russia and uh, China, and because now of Gaza. So, so this is the growth industry together with the microchip market and the maybe quantum computing world and the artificial intelligence world, this is one of the biggest growth markets in the world today. However, to, to be able to patch into that, you need to come up with something which people need and they need it more or less in the next one or two years. And that's where the window comes into the picture. If you have that, you can make a lot of money uh, by I don't think you can create a big company. I don't think you can create a new IAI, but you can make a hell of a lot of money uh, by selling your company to someone who will then take it to the next step forward. If there's one lesson, however, I would want to share with our audience, which I'm sure they know is, there's a huge difference between setting up a startup and transforming it to a medium-sized company. And there's a huge difference between a medium-sized company and a big company. And most companies do not survive the transition from one to two and to three. And most investors don't want to go along for the ride between one to two and three. So you have to change investors, you have to change structure. So people have to start with expectations. If you can set up the first stage and do it well, you will make a lot of money just by that. Not all companies should go to stage two under the same leadership, but that just me. Uh, and my philosophy. Okay. 
So to wrap I'll, up, Mike, go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll just add uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think the most, most important reason to start a defense company now is, is Zionism. It's Tionut. Like, we need this as a country. And it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing, and it may not attract venture capital. So I think if somebody has a, what you call in Hebrew, you know, missionary zeal for what matters to our country, this matters a lot to our country and to the West and to the free world. And it's a hard road to hoe, but some of the best roads are. The second thing I would say is one of the challenges we get old people like me on the call, and you know, Daniel's probably younger than me, but uh, <laughs> he's been doing it for a lot of years, is sometimes we don't see kind of changes changes in the environment. And it could be that we're at a turning point where it's you're, you're finally able to crack through something like this because the need is so existential. And so uh, you know, if, I, if you're an entrepreneur and you're very brave and bold, you can take Daniel's uh, warnings into account, but still think like Andrew did that there was a, a rupture in the force and there's a new opportunity that's come to kind of change the way we develop things. And, and then the third thing is, uh, Daniel said he's product before brand. I'm actually, in these kinds of businesses, I'm brand and price before product. I don't think there's <laughs> such a thing as product market fit or innovation in these areas because if you can't collect money with enough gross margins on it, you might as well not do it. So you need product price market fit uh, in addition to branding e even before you have the product. And so that would be kind of my last, you know, my last thoughts. Uh, Thank you so much. Guys, before we uh, we get off to the weekend, something that I think is dear to both of you, uh, any thoughts, comments on the new uh, proposed draft law that is going to pass in the Knesset? Uh, any, you, you both have expressed uh, uh, on these issues publicly. Uh, Michael? I just tweeted about an hour and a half, two, three hours ago, whatever it is, exactly what I think. I I think, I think we, we need to kind of reorient the organizing principle and the organizing principle of our society needs, about, be, needs to be about service. And uh, I said, uh, one of the things I said is not mechile mishtakene, and uh, that's that's me the organizing principle of the tax system, the economic system, uh, and, and and anything around it. And so, uh, and and it's not just what you want to do; it's what you have to do. And uh, uh, I, I just hope there'll be enough courage. I'm not hopeful on it right now uh, to be able to do this. We have, you know, I've had four kids fighting in Gaza, uh, as you know. Um, they're all about to go back to reserve duties. The one that are out, there's one still there. Um, and uh, they're going to go back in another month uh, because of the extension of law and the circumstances. And, and I'm proud of them. And I keep saying to anyone who asks me, I, I don't know what I've done right in life to be so privileged to be the parent no, of these I children. Uh, really, I, I think it's an incredible privilege we all have uh, that our kids have stood up and fought for what's right. And, sacrificed themselves and, and their families and, and, and their families have been incredible. And at the same time, we need to reorient our priorities. And, and it's time to stand up and say that. I mean, I've been saying it for a long time, but it's really time to stand up and say that enough. And I will just add that uh, two points. One is I have done many things in my career uh, I spent 20 years as a peace negotiator for the Israeli government. I've been a private lawyer now for 20 years. And, but the part I'm most proud of is the 20 years I served as a military officer in the Israeli army. And I agree with Michael that this is a privilege. And if there's one thing I envy in the United States is the fact that when you meet a veteran, many Americans will say thank you for your service. In Israel, not only have we taken this for granted that people are putting their lives at risk and putting their families at risk uh, for the sake of others, but we have allowed huge numbers of people of our population to get away from that and enjoy the benefits of life at the expense of others. So if there's one thing I would like to say, first of all, I'm not against this new proposed law. I just want to make, you know, it needs tweaking to make sure that it makes sense, but it needs to come with two additional elements. A, we need to stop allowing people to benefit from this by not serving and getting 
additional benefits as a result of that because you can't build a stable society based on freeloading people. And B, I, 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 I mirror what, what Michael said, we need to make sure that the people who do put their life on the line and their families on the line and their jobs on the line are compensated and respected for this. So that they're not flyers, but they're the people we look up to and we say thank you for your service. Thank you very much for this, uh, Michael. We hope your kids stay safe. Uh, we appreciate their service and we appreciate, by the way, the service of 100 uh, employees of Herzog Fox Neyman who've been in the field. Uh, for many days now and are returning now to work and we're making every effort we can at the firm to uh, accommodate them and assist them in returning uh, to a safe home uh, and working environment uh, and have a great weekend everyone thank you very much for this conversation <laughs>